Hello and welcome to Cheetah TV. My name is Brian Badger from the Cheetah Conservation Fund. In this series of videos entitled Conservation Conversations, I'm talking to various people from various on various disciplines from around the world, different organisations um, that all are all involved in frontline conservation, not just for the cheetah, but the complete ecosystem. And today's no exception. Earlier on today, I got to speak to Dr. Sugoto Roy. Now, Dr. Roy works for the IUCN, which is the main governing body for conservation policies and, and, and various bits and pieces that he'll explain a whole lot better than what I can. Now, IUCN stands for the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. And um, he'll go through and tell us how that actually works and what the structure of IUCN is. So if you want to get notifications of the upcoming videos of all different types of people that have uh, agreed to come along and talk to us, then please subscribe and uh, set the notifications and please share the video as well, because the more people that know what's going on in the world, the more people that can actually get involved and help. So without further ado, let's go over to the interview and see Dr. Roy. Okay, and a very warm welcome to Cheetah TV. And uh, again, we're talking about um, the holistic side of conservation and all the components that make up um, that holistic side, because it brings in um, various disciplines, various people from all different walks of life, from, of all different skill sets. And today we've got a very special guest who uh, substantially contributed to the Global Cheetah Summit, which was held in Addis Ababa in, uh, in 2024, in January. And um, I'd like to welcome Dr. Sugoto Roy. And uh, good morning, Dr. Roy. How are we doing? I'm doing very well. Thank you very much. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. Um, now, Dr. Roy, he, he works um, with the IUCN SSC, which is the Species Survival Commission. Um, there's lots of acronyms that we'll we'll uh, try to uh, try to iron iron out. Um, but Dr. Roy, if we could start off with, uh, you know, kind of what is the uh, the SSC, and and what components go to make that up? Okay. Uh, so first of all, feel free to call me Soggy. Everyone does um, because it's a mouthful. Otherwise, um, okay. So the SSC is the Species Survival Commission, and it makes up one of the many commissions of IUCN. So IUCN quite, has quite a few commissions. There's the World Commission on Protected Areas. Um, there is uh, the Law Commission, etc. So there's about five or six of these. There's six, six commissions. Uh, in addition to the secretariat and also members. So these are the three main larger components of IUCN. The SSC is the Species Survival Commission. And I actually work for the CAT specialist group within the SSC. So each commission is made up of specialist groups. Um, there are several taxonomic and thematic specialist groups within the SSC. Um, I'm in. I'm a member of uh, four of them, but I actually work for the CAT Specialist Group. And as I said, some of these are taxonomic. Um, there's one on small carnivores, for example. There's another one on ele African elephants, etc., etc. But there are also disciplinary ones, so or thematic ones, if you like. Um, human wildlife conflicts and coexistence. There's one on invasive species management, etc. And uh, these are a bit more cross-cutting. And uh, recently, I should say that the SSE is mostly made up of volunteers, volunteer experts from around the world, um, people who are um, have expertise in their particular species or theme, and they, they, they've worked in this particular area for a while. And most of these people contribute their time in some kind of voluntary capacity. And the SSC has 10,000 volunteer experts. And I should say that very recently, the SSC was recognized by the Guinness World Records for the largest volunteer scientific network. So maybe that's that's answered that question. Yeah, it, it's, it's mind blowing, really, how how broad um, these things are, because uh, a small acronym 
um, IUCN, SSC, you know, but, well, you know, and when we go into what that means, it goes out and it spreads out to almost 10,000 answers, you know, with the, with the 10,000 people. You know, you, you mentioned one, which is the, uh, the Human Wildlife Conflict and Coexistence um, Working Group or specialist group, should I say. Um, so, I mean, that obviously relates, you know, to a lot of what CCF do, uh, because mitigating human wildlife conflict. Um, but how does that kind of work um, as far as, you know, using that umbrella of the human wildlife conflict and coexistence? You know, how does that, um, how does that relate to, to, to the bigger picture, as it were? So I, I like to think of the SSC as a string of pearls, if you like. So, you know, you've got the taxonomic specialists who, are, who work on elephants or cats or canids or bears or whatever. And many of those people are engaged in human wildlife conflict work. Um, and the thematic or disciplinary groups are, are like the string between the pearls. They're, many of the members of these thematic groups have have um, roles in other specialist groups, et cetera. And these thematic groups try and bring together collective knowledge, collective thinking from across the SSC, um, and also include you know, global representation, mem um, membership from the global south, et cetera, to make sure that it's quite inclusive and try and distill and pull out the best practices, current thinking from across this network uh, in order to develop um, products, literature, papers, etc. Uh, very recently, we published in the Human Wildlife Conflict and Coexistence Specialist Group guidelines for managing human wildlife conflicts. This is a work in progress. Uh, that was the first iteration, the first edition of that piece of work. But basically, it was a monumental effort bringing together expertise from across this group to try and develop guidelines on best practice, how to manage human wildlife conflicts, how to deal with stakeholders and, and include them, work with them, um, policy frameworks, uh, the drivers of conflict, etc. So it's quite a, a broad piece of work. And through pieces of work like that, it sort of is the concrete result of this string of pearls approach, if you like. I mean, I, like you, I mean, you mentioned it's a monumental task because you know when you've got that much information coming through and you have to put it together, um, the the that has got that relevance to individual projects. You know, so is the is the recommendations. Um, kind of readily available is, is it like a database or is it you know the, the organizations or stakeholders in general can can access uh, to to draw from that vast um, knowledge that's been put together is that easily accessible for the organizations it, it is it's available as a pdf that you can download it's not a database as such it is um basically, a, if for want of a better word, a book of some description, and you can download this. And it's been translated into many different languages as well at the moment. So there are, there's a Spanish and Portuguese version. There's the Russian version on the, online as well. There's French versions, etc. And I would like to say that, you know, it is, it's got case examples and such in there, but the actual guidelines are just that, they are guidelines. It's a principles-based approach. Um, it's not a mandatory approach. It's not a thou shalt do this and thou shalt not do that approach. It's a have you thought about talking to indigenous people? Have you thought about, you know, it's a checklist of best practice and it's an approach. And I think that's the best way to actually describe it. It's, it's, it's a way of capturing that approach and I, I would also like to say that there are databases of different conflicts in existence i know that the crocodile specialist group for example have a, a database on conflicts uh, incidents etc and there are different um databases across the world on, on either very localized or also a bit more broad on conflicts it's nice to have data it's nice to have information 
um, it can always be used and, and you can use it for research and to answer questions. But at the same time, it shouldn't be the be all and end all of where we're going because, you know, databases, you set up databases and then if, if resources run out or money runs out or capacity runs out, or if it's only managed in some kind of voluntary capacity only, then it's very hard to keep maintaining that databases. And let's face it, the best databases are those that are always kept updated. Yeah, it's a, it's a tremendous um, the resource. Um, the, you know, the 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 organisations, big and small, um, can can use. But like you say, it's about the interpretation. It's not, uh, you know, it's not like a hangs guide that that will that will take you through. That you know, this is what you need to do to to solve your problem. You know, it draws on because what I found over my career is there's so many commonalities between you know between things that you never imagined that were that were connected you know your, your community involvement is the is the most sim simple one you know wherever animals live people will live so it's what it's ways and and uh, kind of highlights um some of the basics that you're doing i mean so to 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 change tact um slightly um, I mean, we know that the human wildlife conflict is 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 a problem, um, and uh, globally, and and different people have found different ways to deal with it, which you um, kind of commented on, as far as the drawing in the experiences, you know, the successes and the failures. Um, so, so when we one of the other phrases that comes up. You know that that a lot of people kind of accept without necessarily understanding um, is the climate change factor. Um, so you know, how much do we need to um, concentrate or, or or take into account the the uh, the climate change factor? Much more than you imagine, actually, Brian. Um, climate change is now and probably will continue to be and grow into. One of the biggest drivers of environmental change and with that comes things like human wildlife conflict so for example let me give you um, a sort of case example if you look at tigers for example as a species tigers like lowland tropical forest etc etc but through climate change you end up creating pressures on the environment so there's parts of india and nepal and um, places like that which are as a result of climate change and climate unpredictability, climate climatic extreme events, uh, where you have things like floods, big rains, etc. And as one of the drivers, what happens is you have alongside that a human population that needs to grow food and is competing for space and resources such as water. So you end up getting in a situation where people start using land that is marginal to where they um, normally would use land for agriculture and they're trying to eke out a living, eke out an existence, grow their own food, etc. As a result, animals are being pushed also into marginal environments and as a result, we now see, for example, that there probably things like tigers are beginning to be found in increasingly higher altitudes, uh, places they never would have been found before, etc. And what climate change does, it makes us, um, it forces humans to use marginal areas, less favorable areas. It forces us into space that would otherwise be perhaps occupied by animals. We compete for space and resources with wildlife species. And as a result, we are driving um, situations where humans and wildlife overlap or um, compete for space and time and resource. They end up fighting. They end up in a conflict situation. We are encroaching on wild habitats. Wildlife is forced into human-dominated habitats. And Climate change is one of the drivers, but it is one of the drivers. There are other drivers as well. Yeah, you you bring up an excellent point because you know when, when we when we talk about the human wildlife conflict, you know it doesn't just you know happen for no reason. 
um, a lot of the time. You know, so you know, you're talking about you, you know, you, you mentioned tigers. If you if you're talking about the Sundarbans, um, you know, and and the, the, the you know the, the huge floods that happen there, and the land mass becomes smaller. You know, where the pop the human populations are not going down. We want to maintain the tiger populations, so something's got to give, you know, and 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 so you know you can. The, the, it's the causality of the human wildlife conflict that I think um, makes a lot more chat, lot more um, sense. Um, you know, when you're when you're mapping out, you know, the human wildlife conflict. Yes, this this is the this is the reason why and. Um, or one of the reasons why, as you pointed out, is one of the factors. But it, at least it's that knowledge. It, it, it gives us that that kind of baseline to find out why it's happening. And some sometimes people just need to know why, you know. And and then it, then it, then the then the mitigation kind of makes a lot more sense, I think. So um, you, you mentioned, you know, the you know we're we're um, at CCF we're primarily talking about cheetahs, but we are a holistic organisation, so we do. Um, take into account other species, um, be it birds, reptiles, you know, and, or, or mammals. It, it, it doesn't really matter if it's part of the ecosystem. Um, do you find that there's there's lots of overlap between the species as far as um, you know the the mitigation of human wildlife conflict or or or, or any other type of conflict? Is there a lot of um, um, overlap? Uh, yes. I'm going to actually um, say this in a slightly different way, therefore. Let's look at our unit of operation as the people who are involved in conflicts, not necessarily the species, although the victims of the conflict often end up being the species, you know, the leopard, the cheetah, the lion, the tiger, whatever being killed. Um, but the unit, unit of operation is the local community, the village, the farmer, um, the golf course owner, owner where elephants come and, and ruin his golf course, etc. And wherever I've looked at human wildlife conflict, so um, in a previous role I was working with tigers, it's most people see not human tiger conflict or human leopard conflict or even human big cat conflict. They see human wildlife conflict. Most people actually complained more about wild boar and elephants than they did about humans, uh, human tiger conflict. So the people who are affected by conflict actually don't see that much species defi definition or differentiation. They see human wildlife conflict. And if we are to manage human wildlife conflict properly, that's where we should be managing across species, not just at single species or taxonomic groups. So not just, you know, humans and cheetahs, but there's humans and cheetahs and wild dogs and hyenas and lions and leopards. And, you know, we've got the entire spectrum of wildlife species that could affect livestock. They could affect humans directly through injury or mortality. Um, and also the prey species, you know, there, there are there are large herbivores, they're large-bodied animals. Just by their sheer size, they, they pose a threat sometimes if they come too close um, and overlap with, with uh, local communities. So I think that's the approach we need. It's, it's, we don't necessarily need to develop a multi-species approach. It already is a multi-species problem, and that's how we need to uh, reframe the way we think about it. Yeah, I get, I, I get totally what you're saying. So it, it's you know it, it starts off with a with a focused in, in intolerance maybe, but that spreads to general intolerance, which you know which is where your overlap comes in, which you know when you're when you're dealing with um, with, with the with the people. You know, you have to look at the bigger picture because you know if you sol solving one problem doesn't doesn't always mitigate the, the whole thing. So um, you know, it, it, it's it, I, I see the importance, and um, and and hopefully um, when we're doing our our farmer training, our future farmers of Africa um, programs and our training programs, you know, that's kind of we're, we're looking. At you know we, we we're not kind of saying to the farmers you know tell me about all your problems but only about the cheetah, you know that mm. does you know that's that's not going to cut it to to one of to one of a better better phrase, so um, 
so when you're when you're um, taking these going back to the uh, the specialist groups um, and uh, when you're when you're taking the um, these all these experts you know how how do we will use um, the Cheetah Conservation Fund as an example, if you don't mind. Um, but but how does CCF contribute to um, you know that that type of decision making or the constructions of the guidelines? So as I said, with the guidelines, the guidelines are, are in their first iteration. It's just basically um, a conceptual framework of a principles-based approach, I think what we should do is test the guidelines. So I would recommend that CCF picks up the guidelines, looks through it and says, okay, we're gonna try this approach. We're gonna try and do this. This is a problem we have. Let's go and practice it in the field. And if it works, that's great. But if they, we're not saying that all approaches work all of the time to 100% efficiency, let's, if it doesn't work, why doesn't it work? Was is there an alternative that would have worked a little bit, little bit better? So what we need to do now is to flesh out these guidelines and put some flesh on the bones of them in terms of case studies, case examples, things that have worked, things that haven't worked. We're perfectly honest about saying this won't work, uh, or if somebody comes to us and said, "Look, I really tried, but this didn't work," that's great because we also need to learn from failures. It's all very well having a very nice principled approach, but not always does that work in every situation. And also going back to the first part of that question, how do you get involved in the decision making side of things? Um, then you start fraying, uh, fraying, straying into the world of policy making and such. And I think the best way to get involved in policy making is to involve policy makers in your projects, in your project design from the outset. Um, if you're giving training courses and training programs, involve government officials, involve people who work for the National Park Service, involve government staff, um, involve also people from other NGOs, community groups, grassroots level organizations, try and make it multi-sectoral. Um, um, in capacity building so that you have um, a face to a name when you start working in countries and you and you want to start working with the government. There's nothing worse than working walking into a government office and you don't already know the people involved in the projects you want to set up or establish. You bring up another point that that uh, that I think is important um, for people to understand or, or to realise, because again, an NGO, non-governmental organisation. Um, now, a lot of time, the assumption is is that you know they then that organisation has nothing to do with the government whatsoever. Where, where you know that that's kind of so wrong. They're not employed by the government. You know, they don't necessarily receive. Um, funds for, or funding from from the governments, but working with the governments and the de and decision makers, you know, because you know we we're not the police out there, you know, we 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 can again make recommendations and stuff like that, but or you can start making you know internal rules, but the internal rules has to fit in with the law of the land, so you know w working with those and a good example I, I think um, relating it directly to CCF is is that of Somaliland, you know where we're you know, we've got a very close relationship with the Somaliland government and, you know, and and they're um, kind of in a different situation than a lot of governments. But, you know, we're we're at the stage where we can uh, advise, uh, draw an experience, you know, and even get different um, governments um, talking to each other, you know, to make, you know, cross border decisions and stuff you know because you know animals a lot of the time they're not you know or wildlife in general they're not they don't uh they don't respect countries boundaries so um to look at that i think is 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 very very important um so you know the ngos um they're they're again they're not employed by the government but they uh you know they have to have a relationship with uh governing bodies of of all different types would you agree I, I wholeheartedly agree. And actually, I would go a step further. I think 
if we are regionalizing cons conservation or actually working at bigger scales, uh, landscape scale projects, etc. That phrase landscape scale, I mean, it means so many things to different people. <clears throat> we need to have multi partner, multiple partnerships. We need partnerships at different scales and partnerships with different sectors. And you have to have the government involved together with other NGO groups. So, for example, if you were working in one landscape, you have to, you Let's face it, at the end of the day, the law of the land, as you put it nicely, um, and the decisions that affect the law of the land is a government concern. You have to have them involved in your projects. And I think uh, multiple partnerships, partnerships with government agencies and other organizations is essential because governments have the mandate to do things that NGOs do not. They have the powers of arrest, for example, in most cases through law enforcement um, activities, for example. NGOs don't often have the powers of arrest. They, um, they have the ability to change legislation. They have a judiciary that they work with if cases get to court for um, wildlife crimes, for example. And NGOs can do things that governments can't. Um, sometimes the bigger NGOs that have projects across the borders of two different neighboring countries can easily go from one country to another and back again and have slightly more uh, regionalized projects. Governments find it often difficult to do this because governments are restricted to the mandate, which is their own national borders. However, there are that even that's growing and changing. You know, there are regional um, bodies, for example, in Southern Africa, the SADC, for example, um, and also there are there are the conventions to work through. You mentioned transboundary work. I, I thoroughly recommend working closely with organizations like CMS, the Convention on Migratory Species, for example, because that's specifically what they do, work with animals uh, across animal populations, across transboundary areas, across borders. Um, so working with a mixture of sectors, governments and NGOs alike, and universities and science-based organizations, institutes, research students. This is key. The other thing I would say is, even among the NGO communities, we have to, not all NGO organizations do the same thing. Some NGOs specialize in uh, community-based work, development, working with local communities. Others are um, better at training, uh, training for law enforcement, training for camera trapping, monitoring, etc. So, you know, we need to m make sure these partnerships work and play to the strengths of each of the organizations within them. Yeah, um, we, um, I mean, we was together um, earlier on this year at the Global Cheetah Summit in Addis Ababa, and the the kind of title of the of the of the summit was conservation through collaboration, um, and I think that that basically says it all. You know, it, it's um, it's not just between um, NGOs or charities or foundations or or whatever. It's it's taking. Every, everybody and and at, at the at the summit as you as you well remember you know we there there was people from IUCN from CITES from CMS that you mentioned um, and you know we we kind of all agreed on this um, declaration um, for the future of the cheetah um, and that was adopted by CMS which which like you say is is very important because then you've got the cross border things and you start spreading the impact. You know, and that's kind of, you know, a localized impact really a lot of the time is just shifting the problem somewhere else, which is uh, which is no cure for anything. So um, when when you're when you've got this massive collection of, of experts and 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 uh, and stakeholders, if, if you like, you know, he's, he, you mentioned before you're in the, you know, the Guinness World Records of uh, of the, the physical size of it. You know, is but is there still room for expansion? Are you still expanding, um, not just for the sake of it, but but through necessity? I think it's expanding. It's growing organically. Uh, to answer your question, there, more and more um, people from the social sciences are getting involved, and they need to be involved in conservation. Um, so you know, 
even in the human wildlife conflict and coexistence specialist group there is the there's a large focus on social science how to do stakeholder engagement how to work with local communities how to get and then analyze and work with and interpret data from um, these sources and I think that's quite important. I think there are other disciplinary groups across um, the SSC. So, for example, there's SULI, which is the Sustainable Use and Livelihoods um, group. And they they deal with things like bushmeat hunting and, and local resources and, and sustainable use of natural resources. So they're, they're on the sort of social science and a bit more economics-based side, local economies. Um, you know, conservation is is changing the world of conservation is changing and you know it used to be a bunch of people who studied a bit of biology and went out to do something and they did a little bit of social science on the side or they would bring in an intern to do their questionnaire surveys or whatever it just doesn't work actually the most difficult data to work with is the social science side of things and the working with local communities and you need professionals, people who are skilled in this area to work with you. So that's been one exa one uh, expansion in the SSC that has been happening. Um, the, the more thematic groups and people with more diverse skills, not just the biology and ecology and conservation skills, which are still important, but they're not an end in itself. Um, so I think if there is expansion, it happens organically through need and necessity, but it also happens um, as conservationists and conservation as a profession, as an art form, call it what you will, itself grows and diversifies. Um, I was um, involved in a series of meetings earlier in the year looking at sustainable finance for conservation. And suddenly you, you've opened the door to finance and carbon capture and all kinds of things like that, things I, I don't really have that much understanding of. But developing good financial projects is also important. So um, I think there's going to be a need for people with skills in things like working with local economies, um, perhaps ecotourism, um, working with local finance systems and markets, etc. There's going, always going to be a need for strengthening and professionalizing the social science aspects of conservation. And people who know how to work with policy, local governments, local governance um, systems, land tenure systems, etc. So we still need the people going out and doing the radio tracking and the monitoring and the camera trapping and the ecology, but we also need everything else that goes with it and develop skills in those areas. So when we we look at everything that's going on and and the um, the expansion of everything that uh, and and as you just mentioned you know the skill sets that are different skill sets that are coming in different disciplines that are coming in uh, for the for the, for want of a better phrase for the for the common good or for the common cause. Um, <laughs> It's the it's the sixty four million dollar question is, is is how do you how do you feel that it, it's going and and what does the future look like you know if all these things keep on progressing the the way that they are you know how how do you see um, the 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 future as far as conservation goes with rose tinted glasses I would say in an optimistic way that um, people are going to be more collaborative, they're going to be more multidisciplinary or at least open to working with other disciplines a lot more. There will be less competition between organizations. Uh, we're already seeing that in some taxonomic groups with tigers now, there's a tiger conservation coalition, for example, where all the different NGOs are working together. So there's less competition, there's less competition for, for just grant making work, I think. Um, there's we're moving away from just applying for a grant for X months or a couple of years here and there and then rushing to try and get the next one. I think we need more sustainability and more cooperation, um, less direct competition, more collaboration. And I think when the conservation world is united, the messages that then get through to the world uh, the world stage, if you like, the CBD, the conventions, uh, CMS, CITES, etc., are more 
clear, they are more coherent, and there is more scope for those conventions and those big players to actually act through and inf and implement some of them. Yeah, I I would to totally agree. You know, and and um, knowledge is king. In you know, not only when you're doing the work, but actually when somebody's supporting the work. You know, if they can understand more. Um, uh, you know, so if we can communicate with supporters, with donors, or you know, wh to whatever level, I think it makes a lot more sense and it makes it a lot more relatable. So, so Soggy, as you as you told me to call you, um, but uh, but thanks very very much for your time. I know um, how busy you are, and uh, and. You know, I, th I think your your insights are invaluable in 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 just that. You know, getting people to understand what is going on, that uh, that is it's not just a cute animal on the screen. That the stuff behind it is 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 immense and it's ongoing and it has to be ongoing. So, Dr. Sugato Roy, thank you very very much for your time, and I'll speak to you again soon. You're welcome. I'll speak soon, and thanks for having me on. Well, I hope you enjoyed the interview with Dr. Roy. I thought it was fascinating to find out how those bits and pieces work because often you hear all these acronyms like IUCN without completely understanding how they work. So hopefully that shed a little bit more light on it. And uh, don't forget, subscribe and uh, set the notification for the upcoming videos um, on the same subjects and various different people that are going to come in and talk to us on all different disciplines all different animals ecosystems and different projects so thank you very much for watching thanks for your time and don't forget if you want any more information on ccf how you can get involved how you can help and just learn about the uh, the global efforts to save the species and its ecosystem please visit our website at cheetah.org so for now from me brian badger thanks very much and thanks for coming along to Cheetah TV.